to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ he who does not love does not know god for god is love. 1 John chapter 4 verse number 8. We welcome you to, to our study of our awesome God and as we think today about God is love, this is one of the highlights and the major qualities that illustrate just how wonderful and marvelous it is to serve such an awesome God. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today and we hope that uh, you'll check out our website thegospelofchrist.com from there, we have a wide variety of good Bible study materials that you can access. It's all free of charge, available 24-7, thegospelofchrist.com. You can access audio, video lessons, transcripts, study questions, just a host of good Bible study material. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, we make those available to you free of charge. It's a free download from our website. Or if you need a hard copy, we can send you a DVD or a CD in the mail free of charge as well. And friend, we hope today that you'll visit the Church of Christ in your area. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Church of Christ and the Church of Christ in your area. We'd love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. You've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about today's lesson or the plan of salvation or any subject, you'll find people there who'd be happy to sit down with you and open the Bible and study God's Word with you. And so we encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your area. And as always, friend, we want to encourage you to download our app that is available for smartphones today, both Android and Apple phones. You can download that free of charge from the uh, respective stores, and that'd be a great way to study the Word of God on the go. All right, let's think today about the beautiful idea of the love of God. Our God is an awesome God, and His love so beautifully illustrates that. You know, when I think of passages in the Bible that illustrate God's love, uh, one that comes to the top of my mind is found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 7. This beautiful passage in the Bible basically tells us God loves us individually. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, verse 7, Cast all your care or all your anxiety upon Him. Listen to this. He cares for you. Friend, we want people to know today that our God loves each and every one of us. I think of an illustration of 1 Peter 5, verse 7. I remember a story being told about a, a group of missionaries who went into Vietnam or Korea or some area like that. And what they were, one of the things they were trying to do is they were trying to teach the young children in that area about God. And so they were having a Bible school for them. And every day they would sing certain songs. One of the songs they would sing was, He loves me, He loves me, He loves me, this I know. He, gave, he loves me so. And I, because He gave Himself, He gave Himself for me. And He loves me so. That being one of the songs. And I remember uh, as a story being told on that. One of the missionaries, every time they would sing that song and they would mention, He loves me so. He said, one of the kids would just light up. Their eyes would get big, they would smile, they'd get happy and excited. And so they really didn't understand it for the first day or two. And finally, they had someone in the room with them when this happened. And they got to ask the translator, they said, This one kid, every time we sing that song and it gets to the point, He loves me so. When we say me so, this kid gets so excited. Why is that? And the translator told him, he said, Well, that kid's name is me so. Well, friend, that's the idea. When we talk about the love of God, we're talking about the personal nature of God loving every one of us and wanting what's best for us. Romans 5 verses 6 through 8 says, While we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone might dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Listen to the beautiful words of 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. And then that golden text of the Bible that so many people, it may be the only verse that some people have memorized, but so many people know it well. John 3, 16. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't it wonderful to know that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 39. And friends, I, I know we think about, we talk about, we believe in the love of God, but do we really understand that and utilize that in our daily Christian life? Is it something that, that motivates and challenges us every day to live for God and to put our trust and our hope in Him? If not, that's something we need to work on. And so today, we're going to think about how can we know, how is God's love seen how can I know the God of heaven loves me deeply? We know the Bible teaches that God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. And friend, we want to offer today some ways by which we can know the God of heaven cares for each one of us deeply. The first way we can know God loves us is that this is so beautifully, His love is so beautifully illustrated in the sacrificial death of His Son, for our sins. Would you open your Bible with me to 1 Peter chapter 2? I want you to see a passage in the New Testament that shows the love of God in action. Look in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 24. The Word of God records this. Of Jesus it says, Who Himself bore our sins in His own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. How do I know the God of heaven loves me? Friend, He allowed His Son to leave heaven. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we through His poverty might be made rich. God allowed His Son to leave heaven, to come to this earth, to take human form, to, uh, to be beaten, mocked, spit upon, and to ultimately to give Himself as a sacrifice on that cruel cross, He bore our sins in His own body. As, it's as the old song says, If that isn't love, there are no stars in the sky, the ocean is dry, and the sparrow cannot fly. Friend, that's what love is all about. God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. I can't help but think about as John sees Jesus approaching early in Jesus' ministry. John says, Behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Isaiah 53, verse 4. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And how we remember that Lamb of God. In 1 Peter 1, verse 18 through 20. He was that spotless Lamb of God, without spot and blemish. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for each one of us. Friend, would you pause for just a minute and think about God's love and what He allowed His Son to go through for me and you? And friend, you've got to see the personal nature of this. As we talk about these things from Matthew 27 that Jesus endured, I've got to make it personal. I've got to realize that God allowed His Son to do that for me. Christ was taken into the praetorium, the hallway of the guards in Matthew 27. And there He was laughed at. God, the Son of God, God in the flesh, was laughed at by His own creation. He was mocked. Uh, they struck Him with the palm of the hand. He was beaten, something like a cat of nine tails, a whip with sharp objects embedded in it, was brought over his back that was taut over and over again. Uh, they placed that crown of thorns on him. They mocked him. They beat him with a stick. They put the robe on him, a purple robe, claiming him to be a king. And then up the hill to Golgotha, to Calvary. They took his hands and his feet, Psalm 22. They nailed those into that cruel cross. And Jesus, as he said in John 12, if I be lifted up, it'll be for all men. He was lifted up. And that cross is lifted above that hill. And in agony, Jesus struggles for every breath until he says, it is finished. Why did he do that? Again, think about the personal nature. Jesus suffered and endured 
that agony and that torture and that pain because that's how much God loves me and that's how much God loves you. Friend, our awesome God is the epitome of what love is all about. And it's that love that ought to motivate us to respond properly to our God. Well, let's think then about a, a second way we can know God's love uh, for us, and that is by the forgiveness of our sins. Not only did God send His Son to die for the world, but friend, God's love is clearly seen in that God is willing to forgive us of our sins. In Matthew 27, verse 46, Jesus asked the question, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know what the answer to that question is? I'm the answer to that question, and you're the answer to that question. The Bible says He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon Him by His stripes. We are healed. We've been, we were separated from God. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, uh, Lord's ear wasn't heavy that He couldn't hear us. His arm wasn't short that He could not save. But our sins and our iniquities separate us from God because our God is of pure eyes than to behold evil and look upon wickedness. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. Now, there are two passages in the Old Testament that really are so eloquent about the forgiveness of, of sin that God offers mankind. And I want you to see those with me. Would you open your Bible to Psalm 103? And I want you to look at Psalm 103, verses 10 through 12. And then there's another wonderful passage we'll look at. Psalm 103. Look with me in verses 10 through 12 at this probably one of the most beautiful passages about forgiveness in all the Bible. The scripture says this in Psalm 103 verse 10 through 12. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Think about those beautiful words for just a moment, especially verse 10. God has not dealt with me according to my sins, nor punished me according to my iniquities. Friend, I deserved to be lost forever in hell because of personal choices and personal sins I've committed. I didn't get that. And if you're a child of God, you didn't either, and it's because of the love of God. All right, look at that second passage I mentioned, Psalm 130. I want you to look in your Bible in Psalm 130. Would you look with me in verses 3 and 4? The Scripture records this. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. When I was growing up as a kid in elementary school, uh, we had a teacher, I believe in the third grade, who had a, a system of discipline. And it was a unique system of discipline that I had never experienced before. Uh, it was a, basically what she would refer to and what others would refer to as a dot system. And basically it was a way of keeping conduct where it needed to be. It, there was a blue dot and that was everything was going good, everybody's happy, you've behaved and everything's well. If you got that card turned over to the green dot, been a little mischief. You've acted up a little bit. You need to watch out a little more. If it got turned over to a red dot, boy, you were really, really close to being in trouble. And if it got turned over to a black dot, you were outside in the hall for a paddling. Now, what if God kept a system like that? Isn't that what the psalmist, in essence, is saying? If you, O Lord, were to mark iniquities, who could stand? If God kept a count, God made a mark every time I sinned, on the judgment day, who could stand? Kind of like the old dot system, nobody. Listen to verse 4. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Friend, our God is a God of love and His forgiveness so beautifully illustrates that. Hebrews 8 verse 12, God said this, I'll be merciful to their sins, their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. God not only forgives, God forgets the things we've done wrong. You say, okay, forgiveness, what do you mean by that? Let me illustrate it in some of the most graphic language in the Bible. 
Micah 7, verses 17 through 19, God says, I'll cast all their sins. Talking about Israel, if they change their ways, I'll cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Did you know that in some places the sea is 30,000 feet deep? Imagine if you took a penny and you dropped it in that hole that's 30,000 foot deep. What's the chance of you finding that when it hits the bottom? Slim to none. God says, I'm going to cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. They're going to be removed so far from them that nobody could ever find them and that they won't hurt them anymore. And thus when Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins, how wonderful that is. And friend, Peter said it so clearly in Acts 2 verse 38 when he told men and women to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Let's then think about another idea by which we can know that God is love and that our God is an awesome God of love, and it's this. God's given us direction, and He's given us purpose in life through the Bible. The Bible is proof that God loves me and you. The Bible is God's Word, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, 2 Peter 1, verse 19 through 21, and a, and a host of other passages clearly prove that to us. But I want you to see the, the purpose and the direction that it gives our lives motivated by the love of God. Let me illustrate. You know, the Bible tells me why I'm here. The Bible gives me real purpose. There's so many people in this life. I think of people who have no real direction, who don't know where they're going, where they're coming, where they're going, don't have any real purpose in life. Friend, what's great about the Bible as God's expression of love is that it gives our lives real meaning and purpose. Would you open your Bible with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, and I want you to notice what the Scripture is going to say in Isaiah chapter 43, Verse number 7. Notice these words. We talk about meaning and purpose given by the Word of God. Here's what God says. Everyone who is called by my name. Listen to this now. I don't want you to miss this. You ought to underline it in your Bible. Whom God says, I created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Why am I here? Am I here to eat, drink, and be merry? Am I here to live it up and have a good time? Am I here to fulfill every lust and passion and desire? No. God says, I created you for my glory. Paul said something very similar in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. Whether we eat or whether we drink or whatever we do, the Christian, we do all to the glory of God. That takes me back to the words of the wise sage Solomon. In uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, you know, Solomon, in the great book of Ecclesiastes, he struggled with meaning, he struggled with purpose, he tried it all in life to no avail, but he finally comes to the right conclusion in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14. He says this, Therefore, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's it all about? What's life all about? Let's hear the conclusion. Here it is. Fear God. Keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Why? For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. I have a purpose in life. As a child of God, I have a purpose in life to serve Him, to glorify Him, and to do everything I can to magnify the name of God in every way. And friend, that gives such great direction as well. When I think of direction, I think of where we're going and where we're trying to get. And the Bible puts us in the right direction, does it not? Paul said in Philippians 1 verses 19 through 21, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Revelation 14 verse 13, Psalm 116 verse number 15. Friend, I've got direction. I'm trying to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, 1 Peter 2, verse 21. And if I do that, like the redeemed in Revelation 14, verse 4, it will be said of me, these are they who follow the Lamb wheresoever He went. And so we want to illustrate as well that the Bible is a great gift showing the love of God in that it gives us purpose and direction in this life. Now, let's think about another way by which we can know that God loves every one of us, and it's this. 
God has demonstrated and proven His love for each of us by providing for our needs. You know, one thing you can rest assured of is God's always going to do His part. God cannot lie, Titus 1 verse 2. He does not change, Malachi 3 verse 6. He's the same past, present, and future, yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13 verse 8. And that being true, I know God's taking care of me and my family and those we love as we put Him and His kingdom first. How do we know that? I want you to look in your New Testament to a passage in Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33 is the passage we're going to look at. But before we actually look at those words, let me give you the context of that. In Matthew 6, beginning in about verse 24 following, Jesus is going to discuss the subject of anxiety or worry. And he's basically going to illustrate that if you get your life right, you put things in order, you put God first, worry is not something you're going to have to worry about because God's going to take care of that. And he kind of brings that to a climax in Matthew 6, when he says these words. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Food, shelter, clothing. If I put God's kingdom first, God's going to take care of me. You know, I can't help but think of what David said in Psalm 37, verse 25. This is, you talk about encouraging verses in the Bible. This is one of the top. David said, I've been young and now I'm old. Basically, David said, let me give you a snapshot of what I've learned in my life. I've been young and now I'm old. Here's the gnomic truth. Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Truly, we can say, as James said in James 1 verse 17, every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow or variation of turning. God's not going to turn this way in one way and we get the shadow one time. No, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. I think of the words of Paul in Philippians 4 verse 19. Paul said to the church in Philippi, My God shall supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. Now, that passage doesn't say God's going to supply every want. Uh, I may not have the biggest four-wheel drive truck. I may not have the biggest bass boat. I may not have the fanciest motorcycle. I may not have the biggest toy that everybody else has got. But you know what? My God will supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. I know God loves me. And I know He loves you because God's going to take care of His own as we put Him first. Genesis 22, verse 8, Abraham said to his son Isaac, God will supply. Here's the wood. Where's the fire? God will supply. God will make a way. God will take care of that. And we can trust in that each and every day. All right, let's mention one other thing that illustrates for us how our God is a God of love and such an awesome God. And it's this. Friend, God showers upon His people the promises of heaven to those who trust Him. And what a great expression of His love that is. We often Christians sing, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. How true that is. Our interest and our hope are not solely based here. I know God loves me and I know He loves you because God has promised us we can live with Him in that beautiful place called heaven. Would you open your Bible with me to the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John? I want you to see these beautiful words. John chapter 14, Jesus illustrated so beautifully the idea of heaven and how God's people can go there. Look in John 14, beginning in verses 1 through 6. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where, you, where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Did you hear those beautiful words of Jesus? In my Father's house are many mansions. Were it not so, I would have told you. And then he said, I'm going to prepare that place. And when I come again, I'll receive you unto myself. 
I think about God's love, I can't help but think about heaven. Hebrews 4 verse 9 says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. After all the running, the race, after all fighting the fight, after all trying to stay on the straight and narrow path, there is going to be a great reward for the children of God. Won't it be wonderful one day to hear the words of Jesus from Matthew 25? Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord, into that place that Revelation 21, verse 3 and 4 describes as a place of no more sorrow, death, pain, crying, all the former things have passed away. But ultimately, God, our awesome God, is what will make heaven great. I mentioned this before, but I used to think, when I was a kid, I used to think about heaven. And I would think about the, the streets of gold. Can you imagine walking on a street of pure gold? I would think about the pearly gates and just hard to fathom the beauty of that. But those aren't the things that appeal to me as much anymore. You know what makes heaven great now? It's very simply Matthew 6 verse 9. Jesus taught His disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven. Friend, if God's in heaven, if our awesome God is in heaven and we will be with Him for eternity, all the rest pales in comparison to that idea. And so we ask you today, in view of the great love of God that we've expounded upon today from the Word of God, are you a child of God? Have you responded properly to the love of God? It's not enough just to say, I love God. You've got to back that up by your life, right? Jesus said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments, John 14, 15. And so, have you believed in Christ as the Son of God? John chapter 8, verse 24. Have you repented of sin and turned to God? Luke 13, verse 3. Have you confessed His name before men? Romans 10, verse 10. And have you been immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. And have you risen out of those watery out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life? Romans chapter 6, verse number 4. We're so glad you've joined us today, and we hope you'll join us next time as we conclude our series on Our God is an Awesome God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.